you consider yourself a fan of comedy? I like good comedy. Good comedy. Yeah. Did you like any stand-up comedians? Kevin Bridges. Louis. Billy Conley, obviously. Of course, and Paul Black as well. He's good. Oh, I don't know him, no. No? No. He's a really, really good stand-up comedian. Is he? Is he? Uh, he's brilliant, actually. I think Dave Allen. What about Paul Black? Do you know Paul Black? Never heard of him. Is it the guy from Edinburgh Festival? I think he's done that before, yeah. Um, what about Paul Black? Do you like Ooh. him? Paul Black? No, never heard of him. Well, he's quite good, actually. You can't be that good. He ain't out there yet, is he? No, no one knows him. <laughs> <laughs> what um, Paul Black videos have you seen before? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I recognise your face from Facebook. OK, not a real fan, not a real no. fan. Have you heard of Paul Black? Yeah, she, she said yeah. He's doing really well actually, he's really up and coming. He's, <laughs> people are saying he's like the next... Is next he Billy from Connelly. Edinburgh or in Glasgow? He's from Glasgow. <laughs> do you know he's doing a show at the Music Hall? I did not know that. Do you know there's like this really amazing show there tonight? Yeah. I've heard of it, what is it? It's a guy called Paul Black. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> and that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Are you Paul Black? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> that might be the case. Oh, no. I don't know, it's great to be Paul Black. Please welcome Paul Black. Hello, Aberdeen, what's happening? Wow, well, thank you so much. Oh, it's so nice to be here. That's my first time ever doing a gig in Aberdeen. Wow. Oh, nice. And it's a very beautiful building in here. I've always famously said uh, every building in Aberdeen is beautiful. <laughs> I'm glad you just came out tonight, though, guys, because I was a bit scared. I won't lie, I, I have a few enemies in Aberdeen. <laughs> and for a bit of context, you know, around about this time last year, there was a certain day where uh, Aberdeen Airport was featured quite heavily in the news. On that particular day, I may or may not have tweeted, fuck me, Aberdeen Airport looks like something out of 28 days later. <laughs> Uh, but one guy in particular didn't enjoy this uh, because every single time I've tried to promote this show, he's replied to that tweet with a screenshot <laughs> <laughs> and captioned it, the North remembers. <laughs> 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 so sorry about that, guys. I don't know, I was feeling like a bit of a hater that day, I must say. Uh, but I'm trying not to be as much of a hater anymore. I'm trying to be a bit kinder. It's really hard to be kind, I think. You know, especially when you start the day with all the best intentions of being a good person, then you go on social media and you see like someone that you went to school with on Instagram who's just got engaged and, you know, they've captioned the photo, so we did a thing. <laughs> <laughs> How am I meant to be kind about that? <laughs> but I have been trying. The other day, uh, I spoke to my neighbour for the first time. I thought that's a nice human thing to do. I thought it would be nice. I said to him, what were you up to at the weekend? He said, I'm so glad you asked. I was like, well, I'm not now. <laughs> he went, yeah, it was a proper bucket list moment for me this weekend. I went to see Coldplay at Hamden. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to be kind about that. <laughs> I've tried, but there was a time where I didn't have to be so much of a hater, guys. That's when we had someone else in society that would be a hater for me. And that's when we had a good old-fashioned Ned. A Ned, a Chav, a Bam, whatever you want to call them. I miss them. You know, they don't exist in the same way anymore. You don't get, I'm talking about like the OG Ned, Helly Handsome Jacket. <laughs> You're playing the Penelidas out of a Sony Ericsson. <laughs> Up the back of the bus. I miss that. Because like Neds don't really exist anymore. They've evolved. The modern Ned like drives to work on a grey crushed velvet sunbed. <laughs> changed. I, I really miss Neds because they were kind of the arbiters of taste in my day. They got to police what was and what wasn't already in society. You know, it didn't always make sense because there was a time where you could upload a video, a video of yourself to a social media platform like dancing with glow sticks in your hands and you would find yourself like the most respected man in a scheme. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, if a Ned had caught wind that you had so much as, I don't know, ran for a bus, Socially, it was over for you. <laughs> I 
I miss uh, when Ned used to do things that were so pointlessly disruptive, like, you know, things that didn't make sense, like putting jam around someone's letterbox. <laughs> I miss that because they didn't get to see the outcome of that. The Ned didn't get to see the 100-year-old woman who was eagerly awaiting her letter from the Queen. <laughs> only to receive it absolutely caked in Hartley's seedless strawberry. But they did it anyway, and I think that's beautiful. <laughs> I also think that there's some positives about the lack of Neds. Now, I think we've progressed in a lot of good ways in this country since we escaped the Neds, but uh, I do think the Nedissance is upon us. Because <laughs> there's a new generation of wee bams coming up. And they've got a lot more confidence than we ever had. And it's really amazing. I know this is true because I live quite close to a school. And every day when I'm walking my dog, I see this group of 12 year old wee bams and across the road, I just completely avoid them because I've got street smarts. But my dog, she doesn't. I was walking my dog past this group of wee bams and uh, she started barking at them immediately. Uh, and the ringleader of this group of wee bams turned to my dog, didn't even acknowledge me, he looked straight to my dog and went, fucking shut up, man. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to respond to this. I, I was uh, a bit concerned, I was like, I was in two minds on how to respond to this situation. And one hand I was like, right, Paul, just walk away. You know, you, you can't argue with a Wayne in the street. You know, and he may be 12, but he's got an elf bar in either hand. <laughs> he's got two litres of prime flowing through his veins. <laughs> I think we both know Paul, he could leather us. <laughs> but on the other hand, I was thinking, I can't let him speak to my dog like that. <laughs> I need to say something. I need to humiliate him in front of his pals. But you know, at this point, too much time had passed. <laughs> yeah, I had to respond. Uh, and I got a bit flustered, I panicked, and I looked at this wee boy and said, look, don't be so bloody cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. So now he turns to me and acknowledges me for the first time, and he goes, here, yeah, you look like you sleep in a bed pure full of crumbs, man. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> you look like you sleep in a bed full of crumbs. That, that comment sent me into like a full-blown existential crisis. <laughs> I spent the next week pacing around my living room like, what the fuck do you mean by that, bed full of crumbs? So you calling me fat? So you call me a trap? So you call me a fat trap? Uh, it sent me into a full existential crisis and it also sent me straight into the arms of a weight loss program. <laughs> it genuinely did. In the last year, I've lost about four stone. <laughs> thank you. Th thank you. It, it becomes less impressive when I tell you that I've lost and gained the same four stone three times. <laughs> <laughs> kind of loses its magic a wee bit. Uh, but I, I'd, I've lost weight quite a lot. Uh, and last year, I'd written a Fringe show, and there was a full section about how I'd just lost weight. And that was all well and good, because when I wrote it, I was skinny. <laughs> but when it came time to perform it, you know, I was as fat as can be. <laughs> but I had to just go out on a stage and pretend that I wasn't. <laughs> it was really awkward. I started the bit off by going, I've actually lost quite a bit of weight recently. I could just see the audience going, Just a guy in the front row turning around to his pal going, what fucking size was he before? <laughs> <laughs> right, this is the first time I've ever lost weight in a healthy way. I used to love doing like all sorts of fad diets. I've done them all. And when I look back in my life, there's one that always sticks out to me. And I think, why as an eight year old boy, was I doing the special K diet with my mom? <laughs> What exactly did I have to drop a jean size in two weeks for? <laughs> when I was eight years old. I'll tell you what, because I remember, I remember the exact event that made me want to lose weight. It was for my primary six school trip to a place called Blair Drummond Safari Park. <laughs> 
yeah, it was uh, a very exciting time for me. I remember dropping a jean size in two weeks <laughs> when I was eight, and I got to the safari park. I hopped off the coach. I felt amazing. I was the most confident I'd ever been in my life. I remember approaching the gates of the safari park like... <laughs> just waiting for my peers to, you know, give me a compliment. And then my teacher said to me, Paul, you, you need to get back in the coach. Because if any of you have ever been to Blair Drummond Safari Park, you'll know that you actually drive through it. <laughs> she said, you need to get back in the coach, Paul, because we're about to drive through the lion enclosure. I was like, look, don't worry about me. Because <laughs> let me tell you something, the lions are not going to be interested. <laughs> There's not an ounce of meat on this body right now. <laughs> and look, see, even if the lions do come up to me, don't worry, I'll simply turn to the side and fucking disappear. So then came the part of the school trip where we went to a place called Chimp Island. Uh, and I remember seeing the monkeys on this island and they were eating apples and bananas. And I found myself kind of trying to communicate with them. I was a bit like, don't know if you can tell boys, but I actually eat quite a lot of fruit myself. <laughs> After uh, this, I became quite obsessed with the Special K diet, which was not healthy, it wasn't good. Uh, I used to do it all the time. Well, not all the time, just, you know, when I needed to, as an eight-year-old boy. So I would look at my calendar, and I'd be like, right, two weeks to the Iron Brew Carnival. <laughs> time to get back on the MILF cereal. <laughs> I actually told that story to an American audience earlier this year, um, and I, one of the girls came up to me afterwards, and she said, look, I didn't get all the references, but that part about an iron brew festival? That sounds incredible. I don't know how to explain. <laughs> uh, I thought, shall I just leave her with this image of like sc hundreds of Scottish people in a field? <laughs> Be like a flower crown, <laughs> UV skin paint, uh, just like watching Calvin Harris DJ out of a giant can of iron brew. <laughs> Or shall I tell her, it's just Merlin, like, you know, Wayne's been sick on the waltzers, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, after I'd been doing the special K diet for a while, my mum found out, because she thought it was cute the first time. And then she said to me, Paul, you can't, you can't be doing that, son. You're a child, you shouldn't think, be thinking about your weight. You shouldn't worry about that at all. You're not doing it anymore. So she banned me from the special K diet. And I was devastated. I remember falling to my knees and going, please, mum, just one more time. <laughs> just one more time. You know I'm good for it, just let me tell you one more time. <laughs> she said, no, no way. You're no doing it. So I was like, well, mum, if you're not going to let me do the special K diet, you're going to have to take me to Blockbuster. All right, if you're not letting me do that, you're going to have to rent me the Davina McCall 15-minute fat blitz. <laughs> You've left me no choice. I don't know if you can tell, Mum, but uh, it's actually non-uniform day in two weeks. <laughs> and these G-Star jeans, they're not going to button themselves. <laughs> I, I, I think if you've ever been fat in your life and lost weight, you'll resonate with, um, you know, that always sticks with you. You're always kind of fat inside in your heart. You always identify with it, and that makes it really hard when people who have never been fat in their life call themselves fat. You know your skinny pal that always says they're fat? I actually had to sit down one of my friends recently and say, look, see if you own a single pair of boxers where you can look at the waistband and the words Calvin Klein are fully legible. <laughs> You're no fat. <laughs> I remember the very first time I ever felt insecure about being fat is when I went on my first ever holiday to a place called Benidorm. Yeah. Yeah, B beautiful place. <laughs> I, I, I went to Benidorm and I remember wanting to go in the pool, but I was too insecure to take my top off. So I came up uh, with a good plan. Every day I would wake up in the resort in Benidorm before anyone else was awake. And you know, I'd sneak out and I'd go down to the pool and I'd just dive straight in wearing a full total 90 trackie. <laughs> 
I don't, I don't know why I was so insecure about the way I looked. I was at a holiday resort in Benidorm. <laughs> if I'd simply, you know, looked around, <laughs> maybe I would have felt a wee bit better about myself. <laughs> you know, if I looked to my left, I would have seen like tens, if not hundreds, of Caucasian children with literal cornrows. <laughs> I was doing all right. I, I really didn't have anything to worry about. After this holiday, I swore I would never do something so devoid of culture again. So everywhere I've went since then, everywhere I've traveled to, I've thought, I don't want to do anything touristy. I just want to like, live like a local and do traditional things. And earlier this year, I got the chance to go to Morocco. It's a beautiful place, if any of you have ever been. Uh, it's a lovely place. And I remember being on the plane there and thinking, I'm going to just do absolutely everything that's so cultured I'm not doing a single touristy thing. But when I got there, I kind of forgot, and the first thing that I did was I hired a quad bike. <laughs> and you know, it's not, um, it's not Moroccan culture as such. <laughs> Maybe like the culture of like a 35-year-old club rep in Magaluf. <laughs> but it's somebody's culture. But I, I remember doing it, and you know, I went, I went quad biking through the Moroccan desert at nightfall. Nightfall, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I went quad biking through the Moroccan desert at sunset, that's what I meant to say. And look, I don't want to sound like a gimp here, but proper bucket list moment. <laughs> it was genuinely one of the best moments of my life. And like, you know, you get those middle-aged guys that like absolutely shag their motorbike. <laughs> I get it now. So after I did that, my friend who I was with, she said, I know you wanted to do traditional things, so I've actually arranged for us to go on a camel ride. And I was like, oh. But I've just been Mad Max Fury roading it through the desert. <laughs> you want me to go on a camel? It's, it's a bit of a boner killer, I won't lie. And she kept insisting that I go on this camel ride and I actually just d did not want to do it. So I started just coming up with excuses, saying things like, actually, I think it's cruel. <laughs> I think that's cruel. I mean, how would you feel if a wee sweaty tourist came to your back garden? <laughs> she said to me, actually, I think you're being quite ungrateful. And I said, look, you cannot call a man ungrateful, right? You cannot take him to Alton Towers and let him go 10 rounds back to back on the smiler and expect him to be grateful when you present them with the Falkirk wheel. <laughs> when I was writing this show, eh, I was looking at a lot of photos from my childhood, and I came across this photo of me and my brother that I'm going to share with you just now. <laughs> Take it in for a second. I'm just going to let you have a wee look. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? People have asked me my full life, how did you grow up in Glasgow in the same household as your brother and he's a Rangers fan and you're a Celtic fan? How did that happen? <laughs> and look, the short answer is, my dad was a nutcase. <laughs> and for some reason, he was absolutely hell-bent on being the first person to make a real-life adaption of Divided City. <laughs> I don't know what age I was here. I think I was maybe like eight, so I'd probably just finished a month on Slim and World. I don't know. <laughs> Can I remember? And if any is here for whatever reason, don't follow football or maybe don't understand the kind of Rangers Celtic thing. It's just this wee rivalry we have. It's nice. It's, there's like no malice involved. No like deep rooted religious hatreds. Spanning centuries. Uh, and subsequent knife crime. Nothing like that. <laughs> it's quite casual, actually. <laughs> but I, at this point in time, for a bit of context, when I was this age, my dad's full-time job was being a preacher. That was his actual job. So my dad used to write sermons and, like, about spreading the love of God. And he'd go around the country uh, and, yeah, deliver these sermons all over Scotland. Uh, and when I was younger, I used to think this was really embarrassing. I used to think, like, all oh, my pals, dads have normal jobs. And I remember saying to my dad, so, like, you just sit in your room and you write wee stories and then you practice them in the living room. And then you go around the country, 
you go into stages where I mic, <laughs> and you try and win over the audience. Get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose you could say I'm a wee bit of a nepo baby in that way. <laughs> but I, when my dad wasn't on tour, <laughs> there was this one church that we went to every Sunday, and it was a Baptist church. It was like a kind of born again Christian, new wave, Americanized church. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, it's not Catholic, it's not Protestant. You know, the vibes there are not like, you know, you must repent, you must fear God. The vibes there were kind of just like, you know what? Jesus was just a pretty chill guy. <laughs> like the Sunday school in this church had a cardboard cut out of Jesus holding a surfboard. <laughs> with billabong shorts and flip flops. <laughs> and they were always trying to recruit new people to come to this church. Uh, and they were always trying to reach out to the youth and try and get them in. I remember the people, the youth workers there, they would say things at Sunday school like, you know, we know after a long, hard week at school, the last thing you want to do is go to boring church. We know what you want to do. You want to catch a flick at the movies. <laughs> Maybe drink a few cans of soda pop. But you know what? I've got a friend that loves to do the exact same thing. His name? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, it was a very odd place to grow up. Very strange. It was basically full of middle class people that were uh, all competing against each other to be the best Christian. It was kind of like The Apprentice, but for homophobes. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad was always trying to impress these middle class people. We were one of the few working class families at this church. And he thought, what can I do to impress them? And at this point in time, the big message the church was putting out was that God loves you no matter what your religious background is, he loves you the same. God loves you whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic. And my dad had an idea. <laughs> and that's when he forced me and my brother to support opposing football teams. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the day this photo was taken uh, because most people just support the team their dad supports, uh, but my dad wasn't really interested, so neither was I. And I remember him coming up to me on this day and saying, right, Paul, we're going to go out and get you a full Selig strip. I was like, thank you. No, we're, no, we're being neutral tonight. <laughs> Aye, so he said to me, Paul, we're going to go out and get you a full Celtic strip. And I was like, well, I don't, I'm not really, I'm busy, I'm playing Club Penguin. And in true Christian fashion, uh, he said to me, look, you're fucking getting it. <laughs> you're fucking getting it whether you like it or no. I was like, well, Dad, how long is it going to take? They've just released Hilary Duff on Stardoll. <laughs> I'm busy. So I he took this picture, and what you can't see is behind the camera that took this photo is my dad going, fucking smile. <laughs> He's saying to my brother, Mark, you just don't, you don't look Protestant enough. <laughs> Paul, I, you, you're no selling it. I just don't believe it. Alison, gonna go next door and ask if they've got a spare balaclava kicking about. <laughs> So he took this photo, he printed it out, and he took it to church the following Sunday, and he was parading it around to all the middle class people going, what do you make of that? <laughs> what, what have you done this week uh, to spread God's love? <laughs> oh, you donated 10 grand to charity? I single-handedly ended religious hatred in my living room. <laughs> Aye, they loved that. They'd never seen anything like that in their life. They were very impressed. I remember them being like, you working class people, you're actually quite smart. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, so everyone was so impressed by this, and my dad got such good feedback, he decided to write his full new sermon for his next tour, and he called that sermon, God loves you, whether you're a Celtic or a Rangers fan. <laughs> 
It was interesting. He took me and my brother on his tour with him this time. So he incorporated me and my brother into the show. Me and my brother went on tour with him. And that sounds very exciting, but when I, it wasn't a world tour. We went to our brove. <laughs> and then we went to Largs. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, but I remember being really excited to go on tour with my dad. So he'd written a full show for us. We rehearsed it. And then it was time to go. We were at our first church of the tour, and I remember my dad being on stage doing his wee bit, saying, you know, God loves you, no matter your background. At this point, I'm in the wings. Imagine this, right? I'm wearing a full Celtic strip. <laughs> I wait for my cue. I come out and go, hi. <laughs> I'm Paul. I'm Celtic. My brother's at the other side of the stage. He's wearing a full ranger strip. Socks and everything, pair of Preddy's on. <laughs> Bear in mind, he's a few years older than me. He's a wee bit more articulate. He comes out and goes, hi, I'm Mark, and I'm a Rangers fan. <laughs> By this point, my dad has now left the stage. He's now down the front, uh, and he's coaching us. You know, like dance mums. <laughs> He's gone, fucking go back to back. <laughs> like we practiced. So then me and my brother would go, and we are brothers. <laughs> and we still love each other. <laughs> and God does too. So as you can imagine, you know, the crowds went wild. <laughs> they loved it. That's when I got my first taste of fame. <laughs> I thought that I belong on a stage. It was amazing. I felt, felt so good after that. The churches had never seen the likes before. Eh, and it was so good that every show, I felt more and more confident when I got the feedback for the crowd. I think it was the third show I was turning up in a full Selic manager's jacket. I was just walking around like, how you doing? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not doing photos today. I'm with the family, but thanks. <laughs> People always ask me every time I do this part of the show, they go, that wasn't it true, was it? It fucking was. <laughs> you have no idea how much I wish it wasn't. <laughs> so I we did more and more shows. I got more and more confident. It became evident quite quickly, you know, that I was the star of the show. Uh, and me and my dad, before we went on our second leg of the tour, <laughs> we sat down uh, to have some discussions and we both decided uh, that my brother had to go. <laughs> he wasn't pulling his weight. His heart wasn't in it. So my brother left the group. <laughs> he went back to, I don't know, school. <laughs> Not me. I was in it for the long run. <laughs> so yeah, I went out to the rest of the tour and before it started, I said to my dad, look, I think we both know I'm pulling in the crowds here. Uh, so going forward, I want some creative freedom. I've got some ideas for this thing. And he went, no, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the preacher. You just sit there and look cute. I do my bit. You're not getting any creative freedom. I went, Stevie, Stevie, Stevie. Let me tell you something. You don't want to lose me here. <laughs> you lose me, you lose the crowds. He said, well, what do you want? It's like, first things first, when I come on stage, I want walk-on music. <laughs> that's what I want. He said, no, son, that's too theatrical. I don't like that. He said, dad, picture this, right? You're on the stage, then you re -hang. I'm behind a curtain. And remember, Dad, you are the preacher. You have the audience in the palm of your hands. They are hanging off every single word you say. When you say, please welcome to the stage, my son, the curtain goes up, I come flying out, the only boy that could ever reach me was the son of a preacher man. <laughs> Sorry, that's good. <laughs> he said to me, no, son, I don't like it. You're no doing it. You're not doing it. And I was like, please, I've struck absolute gold with this idea. 
please, I've struck absolute gold. He said, no, this is supposed to be about the story of Jesus. I was like, right, well, thank you. Thank you at this way, Dad, right? I've struck absolute gold. Frankincense. Mar, <laughs> with this idea. And he shot me down. He said, no chance. So that was it. Me and my dad went our separate ways. Uh, our relationship became somewhat fractured after that. Uh, we only kind of communicated through my mum for a wee while. <laughs> I sat down with my mum and I would have a cup of tea and go, look, honestly, good luck to him. <laughs> good luck to him. No, I mean it, good luck to him. Because he'll fucking need it. <laughs> and let's just call it what it was. Jealousy, exactly. <laughs> So for the sake of my mum, we decided to give it one last go. We went back to church a few months later. There was a guest speaker this week in the church who was doing the sermon, and he got on stage, uh, and he said, Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start today's sermon, I want to welcome a special guest to the stage, my son, Gordon. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is a bit familiar, father-son preaching dynamic. I've seen it before, but it's fine. So then Gordon comes on stage and he says, now, Gordon, I want you to tell everyone what football team you support. And I'm like, come on now. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> Do you know what this wee gimp says? <laughs> Gordon, who's actually wearing a three-piece suit, by the way, he comes on stage, he's about eight years old, and he goes, well, Dad, the football team that I support is Gretna. Exactly, it doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> because now, Gordon, I want you to tell everyone why you support Gretna. Because, well, Dad, I just looked at the league table and I went right down to the bottom and I thought, they need my love the most. <laughs> they need my support the most. And I thought, fuck it. Oh. I was raging. I remember my dad turning to me going, look, see, that could have been you up there. That could have been me and you up there if you didn't have a fucking attitude problem. <laughs> and now you're sitting there jealous. Look, jealous? Jealous of who? Todd and Ned Flanders? I don't fucking think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, we can get rid of this now. It's quite traumatic to look at. Let's get... Never went back to church again after that. Yeah, but growing up in a place like that was very interesting because it taught me a lot about class and a lot about shame and how they're all linked. Uh, because I have the biggest working class chip in my shoulder. I just can't be happy for someone that grew up with money. <laughs> I can't, I've tried, I cannot be happy for someone that grew up with money, no matter what you achieve in this life. Honestly, you could tell me that you've found the cure for cancer, and I would say, aye, but see, when you were wee, did you have a dishwasher? <laughs> Must have been easy. Maybe I would have had time. <laughs> to delve into stem cell research. <laughs> if I wasn't busy scrubbing plates by hand. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's interesting because people that grow up with money always try and justify it, don't they? They always try and make you kind of feel bad for them. They go, do you know what? Yeah, we were comfortable growing up. We were comfortable, I'll admit it. I'll admit it, we were comfortable. But it wasn't always easy. <laughs> My parents actually got a divorce. Sorry, so you had two massive houses. <laughs> Go greet about it in your conservatory. I don't care. I remember uh, when I was younger, I used to feel really ashamed of being working class. I think you grow up with that. If you grow up skint, you always feel embarrassed about it. But I remember the exact point in my life where that changed for me when I started to feel really proud. So it was when I got my very first job. I was working in a shop when I was 16, and my manager used to bring in her son, uh, who was the same age as me. He wasn't working there. He was just there to torment me. He used to always try and embarrass me and catch me out for being skint. But he did it in like a really evil way. Uh, so I'd be doing my job and this boy would come over to me and go, Paul, 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 come here. No, seriously, come here. 
No, legit. Come, seriously, come here right now. No, I don't care what you're doing. Just leave it. Come here. I've got a question for you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, shut up. You have to answer it. Seriously, like legit. First thing that comes into your head, right? Don't think about it. First thing that comes into your head. Top three skiing holidays you've ever been on. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, can I only pick three? Okay. <laughs> And I don't like lying, I'm not a good liar, but I thought, I can't like this cunt, no, there's never been one. <laughs> I thought, I need to think fast. So I said to him, aye, well, there was this one time. Uh, I went skiing for my pal Alan's 13th. <laughs> I went to a lovely place called Xscape. And he turns to me and goes, ah, oh, that's ringing a bell, man. That's ringing a bell. What side of the Alps is that on? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, um, Renfrew. <laughs> I Th think it's French, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I got away with it. He went, nice one, man, nice one, cool. And I thought, yes, this cunt's so posh. He's never even fucking heard of Renfrew. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got away with it, right? I thought I got away with it, but of course, five minutes later, it comes back again. No, 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 Paul, seriously, another question. No, I've got another question for you. No, you have to, you, you have to answer it, like legit, seriously. Everyone knows the best thing about the skiing resorts are the restaurants. What was your favorite restaurant there? It's like, fuck, right, eh. Uh, well, after we went skiing, we went to a lovely place called China Buffy King. <laughs> This is where he caught me. <laughs> he went, nah, I've heard of that one. We've got that here. Is that not one of those gross buffet places? You don't eat there, do you? That is disgusting. And this is when it all changed for me, guys. I, that, that gave me the power, you know, to move on. And I said to him, fuck off. <laughs> You've never been to China Buffet King. You've never fucking lived. See, when you were wee, when you were deciding which one of your six bathrooms to piss in, <laughs> when you were learning how to make a souffle, I was out there getting a warning for putting a king rib in the chocolate fountain. <laughs> we are not the same, and we never will be. <laughs> and that's when it all changed for me. I started to feel really proud about being working class. Uh, and something beautiful happened in the world at the same time. People started to be ashamed of growing up with money, which was amazing. I loved that. And people felt that they had to apologize for growing up with money. And some people felt that they had to apologize to me personally, which is where I really felt the most powerful. My friend bought a flat recently. I was walking around going, this is lovely. Very, very nice place you've got here. Very nice. Much was the deposit. <laughs> she starts to panic. She's going, eh, oh, I think it was about 30 grand. I was like, 30 grand, that's, that's a lot of money. Where'd you get that? <laughs> She's going, oh, well, I'm just saving a bit here and there putting a bit away every month, you know. I was like, all right, cool, cool. Any other sources? She goes, oh yeah, my mum gave me 29 grand. <laughs> and I said, I knew it, you're loaded. Then she started apologizing to me. She was like, I'm really sorry. And I was like, you don't need to apologize. It's not your fault, you don't need to apologize. It's just a wee game I like to play. It's called reparations. It's fun for me, I like it. But you know, actually, it isn't someone's fault for being born into money. You can't really judge them for that. I mean, I can, I can. But it's not their fault. Actually, I think the people I resent more that I'm a, I'm a bit more bitter about are people that grew up with nothing and became loaded through sheer luck. You know, because there's some people that I went to high school with, some boys that I went to school with, and I look at them and I think, see if your uncle didn't just hand you an apprenticeship 
to keep you on the straight and narrow. You're the type of guy that would be showing up to our old high school gates at lunchtime on a mountain bike. <laughs> Just sitting on a mountain bike going, how shite's that school, by the way? <laughs> it's the hard thing about uh, kind of growing up in this and my generation is that you kind of have everyone you went to high school with on social media and you can't really unfollow them and you really want to and it's a bit awkward because you still get to see what they're up to. I went to school with a girl and I wouldn't say that she was like mean or unkind. I would say that she was deeply, deeply evil. <laughs> there was a real darkness behind her eyes. And I seen her posting on her Instagram story the other day saying, so excited for my new job tomorrow. Can't wait for my first day as a mental health nurse. <laughs> I felt like I had to message her and say, sorry, just want to clarify here. <laughs> I just want to clarify here. You know that job that you're starting? It's not to give people mental health problems. <laughs> but I mean, you can't really judge people based on what they were like in high school. We all change, don't we? We all grow up and we change a bit. And I think a lot of people in high school were just trying to survive. We we're just trying to get through it. And I learned the hard way that to get through high school, you just need to keep your head down and fit in. Just do what everyone else is doing. So when I was in first year high school, there was a website that everyone was using. I heard that everyone my age was using it. And it was a website where you could leave ratings and reviews for your high school teacher. Some of you might remember it. It was called ratemyteacher.com. So this was all the rage when I was in first year. And I remember thinking, right, Paul, you need to get on this website. It's what everybody's doing. So at the end of my IT class, uh, when we got 10 minutes free surfing time, I thought, do you know what? The star doll's blocked on that browser anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've played enough cool maths games. It's time <laughs> to go on ratemyteacher.com. So I started writing my first review. I logged on and I went, Mrs. W was an absolute delight in drama today. I was just enthralled by the way she explained the subtext of Arthur Miller's critically acclaimed play, The Crucible. And just as I was about to hit send, eh, I looked at the boy that was sitting next to me, who was also on the same website, but he was typing out, Mr. Smith is a fat specky cunt. I was like, all oh, right, that's what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> I spent quite a lot of high school trying so hard to fit in, but just like missing the mark ever so slightly. Because, I mean, this was a time where I was writing a Facebook status near enough every week saying things like, Lady Gaga is so hot, man. <laughs> the other boys weren't saying that. Of course, what I really wanted to write was, I've just learned the full bad romance choreography. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't say that, because then people would find out who I really was. <laughs> like, high school is a very difficult time, uh, if, you think, if you're going through discovering your sexuality, if you think you might be gay. Uh, I think you all kind of, no matter what generation you grow up in, you just go through a similar cycle when you're gay. You start with denial. So for me, I remember the first time I thought I might be gay, I did what any man would do in that situation. I logged onto a website called yahooanswers.com. <laughs> if you just don't remember it, it was like a website you could just ask questions to anyone in the world, and they could answer it for you. So I sat down at my family desktop computer, <laughs> and I started typing out my question. I'm wondering, and I was like, no, 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 no. A friend of mine is wondering, <laughs> Is it possible to be a man who's only attracted to men, but still be straight? <laughs> I clicked post, five minutes later, my first answer came back, no. <laughs> five more minutes passed, the second answer came through, no, you are gay. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Honestly, I couldn't believe it. I was looking at my desktop computer going, no. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, then you move on to the next phase, which is acceptance 
And I think for my generation, that looked a lot like watching YouTube videos of people coming out. Uh, and then you discovered the tunes, all the songs that were about being who you are and being proud and loving yourself no matter what. And you know, before I knew it, I was looking at myself in the mirror going, <sighs> and I can't change. <laughs> Even if I tried, even if I wanted to. <laughs> but then a few years pass and you're like, wasn't that serious? <laughs> it really was not that big of a deal. I didn't have to be doing all that. <laughs> I'm obviously lucky I can say that because I grew up in a generation where it was a lot easier and also because my family have always been completely fine and accepting because there's actually quite a lot of gays in my family. We have our own wee like segregated table at Christmas, it's nice. It's really sweet, actually. <laughs> Last Christmas, I just had dinner with my full extended family, uh, and my uncle turned to me after dinner, completely unprovoked, and said, Paul, do you know something, son? I don't have a problem with gay people. <laughs> Thank you, I think. I don't know what to say. I mean, this is a West of Scotland male who's never shown emotion in his life. That was probably a big deal for him. He say that. And I thought, you know what, that's actually quite nice. And then he continued speaking. <laughs> he said, I, I don't have a problem with gay people. It's fat people I don't like. <laughs> I turned to him and I said, I thought we were making some progress there. Like, honestly, that, I, you can't say stuff like that. You cannot say things like that. It's not acceptable. You can't say that. And he went, I, I can and I'll tell you how. Can see you gays, right? It's not your fault that you are, you know. <laughs> the way you are. But fat people. <laughs> now that's a choice. <laughs> I said, I can't believe you're saying something like that. That is so ignorant and it's so rude. Do you want to actually just like read the room right now? Let's read the room of your own family members. Okay, fat. <laughs> Gay. <laughs> fat. <laughs> fat and gay. <laughs> and that is your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should apologize. And I'm not apologizing. Because, look, I've done plenty for you fatties. <laughs> and I've done plenty for you gays, I know. I said, what have you ever done 
for fat people. What have you ever done for gay people? What are you talking about? I let you in my fucking house. <laughs> You're always in my house, prancing about my kitchen, eating all my fucking biscuits. <laughs> I thought he's got me there, actually. <laughs> That is true. Something that I think's changed quite a lot about the modern world is our approach to romance, you know, and how we find a romantic partner. It's very different. It's very hard to meet someone organically these days. It's not like when your grandparents met. Have you ever asked your grandparents how they met each other? It's always a wee bit seedy. <laughs> I remember asking my gran how she met my granddad, and she said, well, son, him." I think one day, just walked out the house, and there was this guy just standing there, staring at me. And I, th I think it was the following Tuesday, I fell pregnant, aye. <laughs> That's it, aye. <laughs> Does not work like that anymore. It's very, very hard to meet people organically these days. I feel like using dating apps uh, make you judge people a lot more. Because you get a little snippet of their life and you judge them purely based on that. I seen someone on Tinder once uh, and they looked really attractive, nice bio, everything was good, but then I scrolled down and there was a Coldplay song linked. <laughs> I thought, it's never gonna work. I matched with someone on Tinder once and we were chatting away, it was all good. Attractive person, good personality. They said to me, why don't we just message on Instagram instead? So we moved over to Instagram and they just uploaded a photo and it was a photo of them when they were a child and it was a really cute photo. And I remember zooming in thinking, right into the background going, hold on, is that a fucking dishwasher? It's never going to work. <laughs> but where do you meet people if it's not on dating apps these, these days? Where do you meet people these days? Do you meet them in a club, in a pub? I don't know. I don't like meeting people in that environment. I went to a gay club with my friends when I was single, and my pal said to me, what about that guy out there? He looks nice. I turned around, and there was a guy in the middle of the dance floor, no one else on the dance floor, just this guy staring at me going, You know, I turned to my pal and I was like, I don't know if he's interested. I can't really tell. <laughs> I, I, that's a problem I have. I never know when people are interested in me romantically. But worse than that, I have this really awful trait where I'm only attracted to people who don't care if I live or die. <laughs> it's not good, guys, but it's the way it is. You know, life's too short, I need to cut to the chase with people. You've got to separate the men from the boys. So if I match with someone on a dating app and they say, hi, how are you? I'm like, look, let's get to the point here. Imagine this, me and you go on a date this weekend, right? We fall madly in love. On the way home, I die in a freak accident. How would you feel? <laughs> this guy replied to me saying, I think that would be awful. I'd be really upset, that would be terrible. And I thought, bit fucking keen. <laughs> I spoke quite a lot about the past in this show, and it's not because I'm like scared of the future, I'm just a bit indifferent to it. Like, people really try and make me care about the future all the time, and I'm just not that arsed. Like, every time I see my grand, I goes, son, you know you need to start planning ahead. You need to get on the property ladder. I'm like, Grand, I don't know if you've noticed things have changed in regards to that slightly. And nowadays, <laughs> when you bought a house, Grand, all you had to do was go up to a guy in the corner of a street and, like, tip your hat. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck him a pouch of coins. <laughs> that was that. You got a five bedroom house. Back in front garden. Doesn't it work like that anymore, Grand? I'm self-employed. See, in your day, you could get approved for a mortgage if you were a fucking shoe shiner. <laughs> 
said, well, son, when I was your age, I'd bought a house. Well, Granda, by the time I'm your age, the sun will have fucking exploded. <laughs> Another thing people really can't make me care about, no matter how hard they try, is conspiracy theories. I just don't care. Like, I'm talking about, like, the classics, not even the modern ones, the classics. If a taxi driver tries to tell me that they faked the moon landing, what the fuck's that got to do with me? <laughs> I'm not the solar system, I don't care. <laughs> when people tell me all the apps I have on my phone are selling my data to the Chinese government. So? <laughs> I don't even know who they are. Oh, so a Chinese government official's gonna know that I ordered three Uber Eats in one day. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> it was necessary at the time. <laughs> My favorite one, though, is when people tell you there's like an MI5 agent watching you through the camera on your laptop. I like this one, because I always think, so you're telling me there's a guy whose full-time job is to watch me. <laughs> so he's in love with me. <laughs> is he good looking? I don't know. Like, tell him to pop up. <laughs> I'll chat away to him. Like, how's you anyway? <laughs> Just walking away. <laughs> I, no, I probably should care a bit more about the future now because I've got a niece and a nephew. So, yeah, they say the children are our future and all that. And every time I see my niece and my nephew and I look into their eyes, I always think, great, great horrors await you in this life. <laughs> Terrible things. Things you can't even imagine. But they're bad and they're coming. So I'm not really great with Wayne's to be honest, uh, not great with them at all. Uh, anytime my sister asks me to watch my nephew, I'm always like, I don't, I don't know what to talk to him about. I don't have anything in common with him. <laughs> I said to her the other day, I was like, my nephew is four and 20. Well, first of all, he's five. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I would know that if we could hold a fucking conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, what did I talk to a, a five-year-old about? <laughs> I have nothing in common with a five-year-old. What am I going to say to him? Is uh, Mona the Vampire still kicking a ball? <laughs> I've decided that I'm going to be relevant in my niece and nephew's life when they're teenagers. That's when they're going to care about me. Right now, it doesn't matter. When they're older, when they run away from home, when they're like 15 and they're coming to me saying, oh, my mum's a psycho, my dad's a prick. I'll be sitting there going, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> Look, do you want a fag? <laughs> I've been quite negative throughout this show and I started off trying not to be a hater. I actually would like to do something quite wholesome right now, guys, if you will indulge me. Something a wee bit nice. Um, please only do this if you can do it relatively quickly, and please don't go out your way, but could you all do me a massive favour and turn the torch on in your phone for me? There we go. One. We've got a few. Yes, more, more. Oh, lovely. More. We need more. A few more. Get a few more. Lovely. Can we do, can maybe just sway them? <laughs> wow. This is really nice. Thank you, guys. I really, really wanted to know what it would feel like to be a fucking gimp at a Coldplay concert. <laughs> Aberdeen, you've been amazing. I've been Paul Black. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight. See you later.